So uh, you may know that we are in the period that the church traditionally calls Lent. And this is the time that leads uh, for 40 days all the way up until Easter. And we are uh, just about to start Holy Week, which is the week that leads, um, the last week that leads up to Easter. And we've been going through a sermon series all the way through Lent called Practices, which is really what are the kingdom practices? What are the things that Jesus encourages his disciples to do? And we've looked at a whole bunch of different topics, and this is our last one today. And we're looking at the subject of proclamation, so telling people about Jesus. And today we're doing something slightly different. Normally we have one speaker. We haven't got just one speaker today. We haven't just got two speakers today. We've got three Woo! because it's Preach Woo! It. And what we're going to do today, these are three speakers who do not normally speak in church. In fact, uh, this is all of their first time preaching in church. They preached at Hub before, and we thought you're fantastic. So it's really great that they're here to come and speak. Um, in my experience, uh, good preachers become great pre preachers with good listening. The more you listen, the better they'll be. In fact, the more you encourage them, the better they'll be. So what I'd love us today, just for, I know we're an Anglican church, but for today, could we be a bit more Pentecostal? Yeah? Amen? Can I get an amen? Can I get an amen? Fantastic. So we were going to encourage these guys, each of them as they do it. So Laura is going to read our passage. Each of them are going to preach from the same passage. Uh, and then Laura is going to introduce our first preacher. Fantastic. Great, guys. So the passage today is Matthew 21, verses 1 to 17. It's going to come up on, on the screen so you can read along. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter Zion, see, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds then went ahead of them, and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money cha changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they are indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read? For the lips of children and infants, you, Lord, have called forth for your praise. And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany where he spent the night. So guys, our first preacher this evening is Tom, which is super exciting. Um, <laughs> Tom is a data scientist, which is very, very, uh, very, very clever by the sounds of it. That's so interesting. Tom, <laughs> and Tom is amazing. He leads one of our home groups in Easton, so we're really super excited to hear from you this evening. Tom, so over to you. Thank you, yeah. Thank you. You're much more encouraging than the morning, so this is a great start already. No offense to them, but you know. Um, so yeah, I'm Tom. I've been in Bristol and St. Nick's for about five and a half years now. Uh, and I'm the only person speaking who's never lived in Norwich, which will make sense in like 20 minutes. Um, I'm one of the people doing Love Running, like Toby was talking about earlier, so do sign up for that. Thank you. Uh, it's going to be great. We're going to run and have fun and run some more. 
um, you know. Um, yeah, but for the talk, there we go. So when I was asked to do this, um, I read through the passage, and there were two main themes that like immediately jumped out at me. Unfortunately, M stole one of them, but luckily it's a really good passage. Uh, so I'm going to focus today on what the crowds welcoming Jesus are actually saying. In verse 9, they're shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Now, my first three outings as a baby were to the pub for a walk and to church. So I've kind of grown up in faith. I know what I'm doing, you know, a little bit. No one really does. Um, but because of that, I and most of us read these passages knowing that Jesus is on the way to his death. We know that Hosanna is this song that we sing, that it's a shout of praise that means something like, thank you for saving us. Uh, and we know that that saving comes about through Jesus' death and his resurrection. But in this passage, Jesus hasn't died yet, and he's definitely not been resurrected. To these crowds, Hosanna means something totally different. It's a Hebrew word, a cry meaning something like, please save us. In fact, these crowds are quoting uh, Psalm 118, which says, Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Their shouts of Hosanna were praise, but they're also crying out for a savior to save them. They saw Jesus as a Messiah continuing the kingdom of Israel, fulfilling Old Testament prophecies, a powerful ruler overthrowing the Roman governors, freeing the Jewish people, and taking his rightful place as king. They were expecting Jesus to be triumphant and victorious, not executed like a criminal. And in verse 10, when the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowd answers, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. These crowds know that Jesus is powerful. He's just healed two blind guys on the walk in that morning. They know he's going to save them because they shout asking him to. And they know that he comes in the name of the Lord. But they don't know the full story. They don't know he's got a week left to live, that he'll be tortured, crucified, and buried. They don't know that that's what will really save them. They don't know how any of this actually works. So what's the point of this? Why do I care that some crowds 2,000 years ago didn't have their theology worked out? Well, neither do I. I know that Jesus died in our place, uh, that he was resurrected three days later. I know that we're one with Christ and we have the Holy Spirit living in us, but there's so much that I don't know. I have questions, doubts, and so much theology that just goes way over my head. And sometimes that makes it really hard to proclaim who God is. But this passage comforts me in that, because these crowds proclaimed what they knew. They proclaimed what they'd seen Jesus do and what they had faith that he'd do again. They proclaimed him as healer, as prophet, and as king. And he is all of those things, but he's so much more. They don't get everything right, but they still worshipped him. They called out to him and told the rest of the city about him. They proclaimed Jesus as what he was to them and what he'd done in their lives. So what does this mean for us? We need to proclaim Jesus where he is in our life, not where we kind of wish he could be. So I find it quite challenging when church do alpha promo and they ask, what difference has Jesus made in your life? Because I don't really have a clear before and after. Like I said, I've grown up with this. I've known Jesus in faith almost as long as I've known myself. And maybe that's you as well. But when that changes to what difference does Jesus make in your life, I can answer it. I can proclaim where I've seen him working in my life before and where I see him working right now. My personal testimony involves lots of praying for healing, for myself, for friends, and for others, and not really seeing it work out how I want to. I know that God is healer, and I've seen him heal other people, but that's not really my story. My testimony is praying and praying and praying for healing, not seeing it and yet feeling closer to God than they ever have before. It's comfort through the pain, it's peace despite the x-rays, and it's hope in a God who will make all things new, just maybe not quite yet. So that's what I have to proclaim to myself, to God, and for others. So to finish, I'd like to think of what you have to proclaim today. What would you be saying in those crowds? It might be praise for what God has done or is doing. It might be hope for what he will do, crying out for him to help. Or it might be pouring out your doubt and your pain, crying to be saved. But whatever it is, proclaim what you know. Proclaim it honestly in prayer with God and proclaim it honestly to those around you. And don't overcomplicate things. In John 9, Jesus heals this blind guy by putting this gloopy mud on his eyes and wiping it off and it's all really weird. 
but this guy's entire testimony is, I was blind, and now I see. And that's all he says. It doesn't have to be big or exciting. It just has to be real. If, when Jesus is your comforter, proclaim that. When he's your healer, proclaim that. And when he's your savior, proclaim that. So let's pray. Father, thank you that you are with us. Thank you for all you have done and are doing in our lives. I pray you will help us to see more of what you're doing and give us the courage and humility to proclaim where you are in our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. Brilliant, Tom. Thank you so much. Our second preacher today is Tim, and Tim works for a tech company, and Tim is an amazing photographer. Uh, you may see him taking photos. He's on the media team, and he's here to speak to us today. So please really welcome Tim. Hello, everyone. Um, <clears throat> it's a real privilege to be speaking with you tonight. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I am Tim. Um, my family's from Hong Kong, and um, if you haven't heard already, I work for this tiny little fruit-themed tech company um, from, uh, for almost six and a half years. Um, yeah, so I suppose a little bit of faith background about me then. Um, knowing God hasn't come natu naturally to me. Most of my immediate family are not Christians, with the exception of my mum, and I've only really truly come to know God for myself when I was 19. Um, by fate, one of my friends, um, she was a course mate, and she went to another church, and one day she thought God told her that you should invite Tim to this church called Proclaimers. Um, so she did, and then I settled in, um, and after years of prayer from my mother, eventually I got baptized there. Um, so for those of you who are praying for something that you don't know when the end date is, keep praying. I am living testament to that prayer that might come true, that will come true one day. After that, then I volunteered full-time for ministry there for about a decade before coming to Bristol. And, and so I guess I may as well um, be talking about proclamation today because I went to a church called Proclaimers. For those of us taking notes, I've named this message, What We Tolerate, We Endorse. So I want to tell you a little story. About seven years ago, um, on New Year's Eve, I was driving from Norfolk to Abersock in North Wales to meet some friends um, for New Year's Eve. Um, and part of, in case you don't know, part of the benefit of not having family here in the UK is that you can pretty much do whatever you want uh, over these, period, these festive periods. Anyway, um, I was um, leaving Shrewsbury and crossing into the Welsh border, um, and I realized I was going to be about half an hour late. So I felt that it was important to let my friends know, um, because they were family and we're joining them, their family, um, that I'm going to be late. So I asked my, uh, dig my phone dig digital smart assistant to text my friend, you know, when you say, hey, blah, blah, and then it comes on and say, what do you want me to do? Um, I couldn't get it going. I, I tried four times, and it wouldn't appear on my phone. So I thought, oh, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to press the button and touch my phone. Don't do that. If you're driving, don't, don't touch your phone. Um, but I did. And then before you know it, I hit a curb at 60 miles an hour. Yeah. You all know what, it, what it's like. In case of, you don't know, my steering wheel starts shuddering like this every time I drove faster than 30 miles an hour. It was not, not fun, and I still had an hour and a half to go. Um, so right at this precise moment, a storm started brewing. Like it, it was a storm that you'd never seen before. You, know, you can hear the rain slapping on the windscreen. Um, and then my sat-nav sat disappeared. Um, th there was a blue line, but I couldn't see where the surrounding was, the buildings, the names, nothing. It was a gray screen of a blue line. Um, and I was in the middle of Snowdon National Park. Um, if I haven't told you already, I'm from Norfolk. I'm, in, I'm from East Anglia. I've never been to this part of the country. And then this storm is brewing. And then, get this, right? So I have this nine-hour playlist that I've mixed in loads of songs, you know, pop, jazz, uh, rap, R&B, and obviously worship music. For the four hours that I was driving, no worship music came on until this moment. And then it was worship music after worship music after worship music. So in my head, I was going to die. Um, <laughs> I was about to meet my maker, and this is him welcoming me. But thankfully, not yet. Um, but think about it, all that fear, all that stuff that was stirring in my brain, just because I got distracted. Distraction, however well-intentioned, can be deadly. 
And this takes us to the verse, uh, to our passage, verse 12 and 13, where we're looking at uh, today. As Jesus was making a really loud ruckus as he enters the temple in Bethage, he began to drive out the people selling and trading in sacrificial animal. Then he started knocking over and flipping the tables and chairs of these money changers and dove sellers. Like, if I didn't know any better, I would imagine this sort of like a mafia film, right? That one gang coming in, trying to start a fight to claim others', uh, others territory. Kind of like Peaky Blinders. Um, I'm... But in some ways, he is. Because in verse 13, he clearly, he's clearly drawing the line between territories. My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. It may seem overdramatic, but like everything else that Jesus does, it is intentional. Firstly, these sacrificial animal traders and money changers are distractions. They are distractions from what is about to happen in the temple. The miracle in which Jesus was about to perform, where he heals the blind and the lame in verse 14. He is removing these distractions now. But secondly, these distractions didn't just happen by chance. Imagine if the same traders were here with the setup shop in Sinex, right? Before you walk in, there were people outside in the corridor, and they were selling you cushions for you to kneel, and they were selling you lyrics for tonight's worship, and they were making a loud noise outside. Lots of people would have seen it. And our church leader would have went, do you know what, whatever. Just let it be. The same way in this temple that the leading priests and the teachers of religious law would have been either not bothered, bothered to deal with it or be intentionally okay in this temple. Sometimes the best way to remove distraction is to kick up a ruckus. Like, you know how you have to hit a rug before you kick up the dust? In this case, what you tolerate is what you endorse. And Jesus makes it let known that these specific distractions that he is removing, these are the ones. He is not keeping quiet, he's telling everyone. As we fast forward to verse 15, after Jesus has performed his healing miracles. And everyone was shouting, Hosanna, which is an exclamation of joy and praise and adoration. Everyone except the priests and the teachers of the law. They were indignant. In um, the King James Version of the Bible, they said they were sorely displeased. Oof. Can you imagine? The very same leader, leaders who allowed these distractions to happen in the temple, while everyone else was proudly proclaiming the name of Jesus, they were indignant. What we tolerate, we endorse. I wonder for those of us who consider ourselves as Christians in our proclamation of Jesus in our lives, what distractions have we allowed to rule over our hearts above Jesus? Maybe it's something innocuous. Maybe it's something that you know that has been there for a while and that you've left it untreated. Something that is preventing you from fully proclaiming Jesus' glory over your life and living the way he intended for us. Because let's be honest, we all have distractions that prevent us from being able to fully proclaim Jesus in our lives. I don't know what it is, but what I do know is that while we're not perfect, we can still actively become someone that is more and more distraction-free, more and more abandoning in these distractions in our pursuit of in our pursuit and proclaiming of Jesus. So you might be sitting here thinking, okay, Tim, you've talked about that. What can I do? Here are four things I think we can get started on. Number one, we need to be honest and open about these distractions. You need, we need to talk to someone you trust about them, someone in your community. Build a community around you so that you can, be, you can be accountable to them. Number two, like Jesus actively removing these tables in the temple, we need to deal with these distractions. We need to be actively praying over it, asking God to work in your life by the power of the Holy Spirit, and then we need to work on them. Number three, we need to be celebrating little milestones as you, as you move on from these distractions. We need to celebrate them because we need to allow grace in our lives to work in our life. Number four, we start at step one again and move on to the next distraction. Like Jesus in the temple who needed to remove all these distractions before performing his miracles, are we going to be indignant because we were the ones who allowed these distractions to take place? Or are we going to be the ones shouting Hosanna in pro proclamation? What if, what if we're able to live a life bit by bit without having to look over our shoulders? What if we're able to fully embrace the freedom that Jesus has given us? Because when we remove distractions, 
we can proclaim with no reservations. Let us pray. Dear Lord God, we thank you that we're able to gather here to worship you today, Lord Jesus. And I pray, Lord, as we move into our weeks, that the distractions that we see, that we, we learn to lift it up to you, Lord Jesus. We learn to lift it up through our communities that we are able to trust, Lord Jesus, and we're able to lift them up to you. Because we, we here, we want to worship you fully without distraction, fully, Lord Jesus. We want to give you we will give ourselves to you fully with no distractions. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much, Tim. That was brilliant. Um, our final speaker tonight is Emily. Emily um, is amazing. She works for a charity called Unseen, which works with um, people affected by modern slavery. Um, and she's also on our central hub team. So thanks, Emily. Excited to hear from you. Hi. Oh, hi, friends. Yeah, as Laura just said, my name is Emily. Um, I also used to live in Norwich. I moved to Bristol in the June of, yeah, the best place. I moved to Bristol in the June of last year um, after being in Norwich for six years and working for a church there and studying there. And I've been at St. Nick's since I moved. Um, yeah, I work for a charity called Unseen as a caseworker. So my day to day life is working with survivors of exploitation, trafficking, and slavery and kind of supporting them through their recovery period, which is, yeah, an intense time. But I'm very thankful to be there. I think the best way of describing it is to say it is the greatest privilege and the hardest thing that I've ever done in my life in equal measures, but it is such a joy. And I'm so excited to be kind of wrapping up today's sermon series on proclamation. And the question I want to ask you is where have you been positioned to proclaim? Where have you been positioned to proclaim? For me, the word proclamation can feel quite daunting and as though it requires something that I don't feel super equipped to bring. But I feel like when we read the Palm Sunday story, we see otherwise. Because it's super easy to see the story as just that, this like really nice story that we've become quite accustomed to growing up and hearing it a lot. But as I spent time in the passage in preparation for today, I felt like what we actually see is this interconnected web of people and abandonment of routine in the name of proclamation. And maybe you see that right now and maybe you don't, but it is all over the story. We see it in the disciples' kind of random act of fetching a donkey for Jesus to ride in on. And in that, we see this simple yet powerful obedience, which by its nature proclaims that Jesus is worthy of service and of our yes. We see it in the crowd's desperation to pave the way for Jesus to come in, you know, using their everyday materials to do so. In that, the proclamation of Jesus as the holy priority and the one deserving of honor. We see it in the shouts of praise and Hosanna. And like we've already said, Hosanna literally just is like a cry of salvation and adoration towards Jesus. We see this proclamation through these words of adoration and this cry for salvation, which is just this kind of heart cry of the people in that moment of their desperation for Jesus and confidence in who he is. And finally, even in the simple answer to the question, who is this? Ordinary people in their ordinary day-to-day, -day, positioned to proclaim. Welcoming in the holy disruption of Jesus in the mundane of their lives and utilizing where they had been positioned with what they had in their hands to declare who Jesus was. For me, this passage is super helpful because it kind of removes proclamation from the super narrow box that I place it under the, in of these public acts of declaration, which can at times feel a little bit daunting. And while these are necessary and totally valid, I long for my life to be one in the continual pursuit of proclaiming the good news of a redemptive saviour. As I was reflecting um, this week on what that looks like for me personally, I was kind of thinking about how it looked different in different seasons, you know, different cities, different jobs, different churches, different seasons of life. But for me on a personal level, it always boils down to the call to justice and specifically the call of the church to justice as well. Before I moved to Bristol, I was working for a small church um, in the heart of one of the biggest estates in the city in Norwich where I was living. And I moved onto the estate when I was about 21 after I graduated uni um, to help oversee some of the community outreach work there. And I began to help kind of build up our discipleship of some of the people that we were working with. 
And if I'm honest, before I moved on and people found out where we were moving to, like we were just told a lot of horror stories about that area and about the things that we were going to encounter. And if I'm honest, that also led to me feeling like this pressure to see like revival in the first 10 days and to see all this change, which led to a lot of discouragement when we didn't see that straight away. There was this one morning about a year in, I was into my second year there, and I was just kind of feeling a bit discouraged in general. And I was prayer walking the estate quite early, about 7.30 in the morning, just a bit grumpy with the Lord, to be honest, like, what are you doing? Why am I here? I like, don't know what this is all about. And I was prayer walking the estate, and the estate was often full of quite a lot of litter, a lot of like random pieces of furniture just like lingering on the street where you're not quite sure where they've come from. And we would often see drug deals happen in our car park as we were eating our dinner. And I was just like feeling so heavy with the burden of how we see the name of Jesus proclaimed in that place. And as I was walking, I was kind of looking down and looking at the mess. And in that moment, the Lord, like clear as day, just said to me, Emily, this place is so beautiful. Like, this place is so beautiful. And it just hit me because I just realized in that moment that I had been positioned to proclaim a different narrative. In 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 8, it says, Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. I began to see that God had, yes, positioned me to proclaim in the words that I spoke to my neighbors and the people around me, but also in the way that I shared my life with them. And this verse became really key for me as I was living there. I felt like I was called there to declare and to proclaim that these people, that this place, that this estate, this ground that I was walking was worthy of investment and full of value, whether the world saw it or not. And where the world saw no hope, God spoke hope. There were um, these two wonderful ladies that I'd meet with once a week to do a Bible study with. And if I'm honest, I just had no clue what I was doing. I was like, yeah, like we'll just read the Bible together and we'll figure it out. But I constantly just fell out of my depth. And so I was just like trying to use what I had in my hands to do it, which was honestly just the Bible and this conviction that I was like, I know Jesus wants to meet with you. I just don't quite know how this is going to happen. Some weeks we would sit in my lounge and there would just be tears for the whole hour from me and them at times, like, I don't know what's going on. Some weeks there were moments of breakthrough. Some weeks they just didn't even show up at all and I wouldn't hear from them for a couple of weeks. Some weeks I felt like we weren't getting anywhere and I was doing an awful job of explaining the Bible to them. And neither of them were super confident readers, so some weeks they came just full of frustration that they couldn't get to grips with the passages for themselves. Until this one day... One of them walked into my house and was like, Emily, I want to get baptized. And I was like, oh my gosh, I was like, that's amazing. And it was just this moment of the Lord being like, Emily, see, like in the mess, I was moving the whole time. And as we wrote her testimony together, we were writing it for her day of baptism and we were kind of writing down her story and her journey to Jesus. And it was just this moment of realizing that Jesus had been in the process the whole time. That somehow, in the mess of it all, he had made himself known through my imperfect proclamation as I just tried to make way for him to come through and to welcome his holy disruption in the day-to-day of where he had placed me. But what about for you? Do you believe that you have been positioned to proclaim? Are you open to the holy disruption of Jesus to come on in and use you to proclaim who he is? Why don't you take a second to think about your life, your workplace, the place you live, or your university campus, or your gym? And then what about the people there? Your colleagues, your friends, family, the people you see on your daily commute? What about your daily rhythms and routines, your everyday practices? And what does it look like to not only proclaim Jesus through your words, but also in the way that you share and live out your life in those spaces that you have been purposefully positioned to proclaim in? Because you have been positioned with purpose in even the most mundane of things. And we watch in the Palm Sunday story as the people physically line this way for Jesus to come on in, into the epicenter of their lives. And as they do so, they cannot help but declare his goodness in the process. So will you let him do the same? Will you let him disrupt your day to day and use your life where he has placed you as a vessel for proclamation, however messy or imperfect it may seem? 
and will you let him use it for his glory? Why don't we pray? Jesus, I pray that you would catalyze us for proclamation in the spaces that you have placed us in. I thank you that you are a God of intention, that you don't do things by coincidence or by accident, but that each person in this room has been positioned to proclaim. And I pray that this week you would just reveal that more clearly to us that we would welcome your holy disruption in our lives, we would live in a deeper and greater surrender, and that you would use everything for your glory and for your kingdom to come in the spaces that we've been placed in. So we just say, Jesus, come on in. Come on in. We make room for you in our lives. And would you help us to know more deeply that we have been positioned to proclaim the good news of a Savior that redeems all things. In Jesus' name, amen.